So I'm hoping the uh, sound of rain does not uh, overpower this video. Anyway, we have The Borrowers of Field by Mary Norton. Now, and this will be the second book in the installment of The Borrowers. Um, if you guys haven't yet, you need to go ahead and purchase these uh, books. And there's also the first book, which has already been read previously. So if you could go ahead and grab your copies of the book, The Borrowers of Field. It's a beautiful, beautiful series written by Mary Norton. And let's go ahead here. And we're going to jump right in, if I can find it, to chapter one. What has been may be. First recorded eclipse of the moon, 721 BC. It was Kate who, long after she was grown up, completed the story of the borrowers. She wrote it all out many years later for her four children and compiled it as you compile a case history or a biographical novel from all kinds of evidence. Things she remembered, things she had been told, and one or two things we had better confess it, at which she just guessed. The most remarkable piece of evidence was a miniature Victorian notebook with gilted pages discovered by Kate in a gamekeeper's cottage on the Studdington estate near Leighton Buzzard, Bedford Shield. Old Tom Gooden, the gamekeeper, had never wanted the story put in writing, but as he had been dead now for so many years, and as Kate's children were so very much alive, she thought that perhaps, wherever he might be, and in the name of good enough, it was bound to be heaven, he would have overcome this kind of prejudice, and would by now, perhaps, forgive her and understand. Anyway, Kate, after some thought, decided to take the risk. When Kate had been a child herself and was living with her parents in London, an old lady shared her home. She was, I think, some kind of relation. Her name was Miss May. And it was Miss May on those long winter evenings beside the fire when she was teaching Kate to crochet who had first told Kate about the borrowers. At that time, Kate never doubted their existence. A race of tiny creatures, has like to humans, has makes no matter. Who live their secret lives under the floors and behind the wainscots of certain quiet old houses. It was only later that she began to wonder, and how wrong she was, she soon found out. There were still to be, had she only known it, developments more unlooked for the extraordinary than any Miss May had dreamed of. The original story had smacked a little of hearsay, Miss May admitted. In fact, had been at some pains to convince Kate. Then she, Miss May, had never actually seen a borrower herself. Any knowledge of such things she had gained at second hand from her younger brother, who, she admitted, was a little boy with not only a vivid imagination, but well known to be a tease. So there you were, Kate decided, thinking it over afterwards. You could take it or leave it. And truth to tell, in the year or so which followed, she tended rather to leave it. The story of the borrowers became pushed way in the back of Kate's mind with other childish fantasies. During this year, she changed her school, made new friends, acquired a dog, took up skating and learned to ride a bicycle and there was no thought of borrowers in Kate's mind, nor did she notice the undercurrent of excitement in Miss May's usual calm voice. When, 
One morning at breakfast, in early spring, Miss May passed a letter across the table saying, This will interest you, Kate, I think. It didn't interest Kate a bit. She read it, though, twice, in a bewildered kind of way, but could make neither head nor tail of it. It was a lawyer's letter from a firm called Jobson. Thring. Bigwid and Bigwid. Not only was it full of long words like beneficiary and disentailment, but even the medium-sized words were arranged in such a manner that, to Kate, they made no sense at all. Names there were in plenty. Steddington, Good Enough, Amberforce, Pocklington, and quite a family of people who spelled their name deceased with a small D. Thank you very much, Kate said politely, passing it back. I thought perhaps, said Miss May, you might like to go down with me. Go down where? said Kate in her vaguest manner. My dear Kate, exclaimed Miss May, what was the point of showing you the letter? The Lexington buzzard, of course. The Lexington buzzard? Years afterwards, when Kate described the scene to her children, she would tell them how, at these words, her heart began to thump long before her mind took in their meaning. Lexington buzzard? She knew the name, of course. The name of an English country town. Somewhere in Bedfordshire, wasn't it? Where great Aunt Sophie's house was, said Miss May, prompting her. Where my brother used to say he saw the borrowers. And before Kate could get back her breath, she went on, in a matter-of-fact voice. I have been left a little cottage, part of the Seddington estate, and, her color deepened, as though what she was about to say now might sound slightly incredible. 355 pounds enough, she added in happy wonderment, to do it up. Kate was silent. She stared at Miss May, her clasped hands against her middle, as though she still the beating of her heart. Could we see the house? She said at last, a kind of croak in her voice. Of course. That's why we're going. Uh, I mean the big house. Aunt Sophie's house. Oh, that house. Fairbank Hall, it was called. Miss May seemed to be taken aback a little. I don't know. We could ask, perhaps... It depends, of course, on whoever is living there now. I mean, Kate went on, with controlled eagerness, e even if we couldn't go inside, you could show me the grating, and Arietti's bank, and even if they opened the front door only ever so little, could you show me where the clock was? You could kind of point with your finger quickly. And as Miss May still seemed to hesitate, Kate added suddenly on a note of anguish. You did believe in them, didn't you? Or was it... Her voice faltered. Only a story. And what if it were only a story? Said Miss May quickly. As long as it was a good story. Keep your sense of wonder, child. And don't be so literal. Anything we haven't experienced for ourselves sounds like a story. All we can ever do is sift the evidence. Sift the evidence? There was, Kate realized, calming down a little, a fair amount of that. Even before Miss May had spoken of such creatures, Kate had suspected their existence. How else to explain the steady, but inexplicable disappearance of certain small objects about the house. Not only safety pins, needles, pencils, blotting paper, matchboxes, and those sort of things, but even in Kate's short life, she had noticed that if you did not use a drawer 
For any length of time, you would never find it quite as you had left it. Something was always missing. Your best handkerchief. Your only bobkin. Your carnal heart. Your lucky sixpence. But I know I put it in this drawer. How often she had said these words herself. And how often had she heard them said. As for addicts. I'm absolutely certain. Kate's mother had wailed only last week on her knees before an open trunk searching vainly for a pair of shoe buckles. That I put them in this box with the ostrich fan. They were wrapped in a piece of black wadding and I slipped them here just below the handle. And the same thing with writing desks, sewing baskets, button boxes. There was never as much tea next day as you had seen in the caddy the evening before. Nor rice, for that matter. Nor lump of sugar. Yes, Kate decided. There was evidence. If only she knew how to sift it. I suppose, she remarked thoughtfully, as she began to fold up her napkin. Some houses are more apt to have them than others. Some houses, said Miss May, do not have them at all. And according to my brother, she went on, it's the tidier houses, oddly enough, which attract them most. Borrowers, he used to say, are nervous people. They must know where things are kept and what each human being is likely to be doing at any hour of the day. In untidy, noisy, badly run houses, oddly enough, you can leave your belongings about with impunity. As far as borrowers are concerned, I mean. And she gave a short laugh. Could borrowers live out of doors? Asked Kate suddenly. No, not easily, said Miss May. They need human beings. They live by the same things human beings live by. I, I was thinking, went on Kate, about Pod and Homily and Larry, little Arietti. I mean, when they were smoked out from under the floor, how do you think they managed? I often wonder, said Miss May. Do you think, asked Kate, that... Arietti did become the last living borrower, like your brother said she would? Yes, he did say that, didn't he? The last of her race. I sincerely hope not. It was unkind of him, Miss May added reflectively. I wonder how, though, they got across those fields. Do you think they ever did find the badger set? We can't tell. I told you about the pillowcase instant, incident when I took all the dollhouse furniture up there in a pillowcase. And you smelled something cooking? But that doesn't say our family ever got there, Pod and Homily and Arietti. The cousins lived in the badger set too, didn't they? The Hendrys? It might have been their cooking. It might, of course said Miss May. Kate was silent for a while, lost in reflection. Suddenly her whole face lit up and she swiveled round in her chair. If we do go, she cried, where shall we stay? In an inn? Thank you there for tuning in to this uh, first chapter here of The Borrowers. Stay tuned for more chapters and for more books coming up. We've got a couple of series that right now we're looking up. Um, there's like the cat who, and then it, it's got a big long thing. And those are kind of um, mysteries and such. And they're pretty good books. So we're going to look into them and see that as well. Um, and see if they're, uh, how their copyright and everything is written. And if we can even get added to it maybe. Anyway, I did want to thank you guys so much for tuning in today. And I hope you guys are having a wonderful and blessed day.
day.